So Brent gets a prayer, but I just have to go on my own. Okay? So, no, it's okay. Does anyone else want to have it? No, it's okay. I'll go on my own. Isn't it good having Brandon Lyon and Dusty back in the house? Hey, aren't they awesome? I love them. I see that Dusty's got Alan's haircut there, Brad. That's good. <laughs> Did you see Alan in the pictures? He looks like he's lost like 30 pounds. What's he doing, man? You guys riding and stuff down there. He's got that new knees. Oh, yeah, he's got new knees. He's all a brand new man. Happy days. It is good seeing the pictures. I got a bit jealous of how you guys have so many meals together. How much you guys have like just a big dinner table? And then I was like, I don't know if any of you were spotting all the people you don't know. I'm like, hey, who's that? You know, did anyone get a little defensive? Like, what are you doing there? Wait a second, are they good people? Uh, so, very much in love with it. And your church has got more bold. I mean, your church um, logos have gotten more bold. We used to have I love no what what, what I heart Trugan. Yeah. Now it's Jesus loves Cooley. You've like taken it to the next level. Yeah. I like Dusty's got one. Yeah. So good. Oh, happy days. Well, I'm happy because we're past the hardest parts in Romans. <laughs> I've loved Romans, but it's been difficult sometimes. And I was so glad to be sick at home last week with Melania as Jess had to tackle chapter 9 to 11. Mainly because it's kind of the crux of the theology of Romans, which is brilliant. I mean, we can't ever, even though things are hard, we shouldn't shy away from them, right? Like things that are hard are good for us. And we see guys like Martin Luther and all these other heavy hitters in the faith getting undone by Romans, and so we ought to be doing the same. But what happens after chapter 11, when we move into chapter 12, is that we start moving into how the outworking of that looks, and so we've got our foundation right, now we're trying to figure out what to do with that. And so my blessed blessing this morning is to be able to go through Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 8, which is one of the greatest passages in the Bible, and have a look at what everything we've talked about so far looks like on a daily, um, hourly, weekly kind of um, outworking. Okay, so if you've got your Bibles, please open them up to Romans chapter 12, and we'll be going through it on the screen as well if you forgot your Bible, or you can open it on your phone, have different versions up. That's also helpful as well. All right. There... Four. All right. After talking about, you know, how the Israelites and the the culture amalgamated, and the Jews and the Gentiles, and what happened there, and everything else, all that good theology we've been covering, he says, therefore, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform any to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Okay? What an awesome passage. He's talking about what true and proper worship looks like. Okay? So there's one element of worship that is what we experienced earlier with Alex and the team, that's some worship. But that's not the full extent of what God has for you when it comes to living a life of worship. And this Tuesday, I have a really fantastic milestone coming into my life. This Tuesday, I never have to drive to Brisbane ever again. Yes! Right? Now, for the last three and a half years, God's opened a door for me to teach at a college up there. But this is my last lecture on Tuesday, so no longer will I leave at 6.15 for a 9 o'clock lecture. Everyone who gets on the M1 every morning, give me a grunt of, like, you know, communal kind of, like, anger. Right? But for the last three and a half years, I've been trying to brainwash. There's been 14... No, 400 students in this time. And I've been trying to brainwash them that this is true worship. That they come to this college and they study education and they study business and arts and humanities and social science and all these other degrees. But because it's a Christian um, college, they do two subjects with me on what it looks like to have a Christian perspective of work and vocation. And they come here thinking that they're going to get equipped for a job. And my job is to, to like, just 
badger them with the truth that your job is your ministry. And every day when you get up to work, that's where God has called you to be. And as you be transformed by the renewing of your mind and as you walk in this truth, then you get to outwork that in your workplace and in your vocation, which is whether you're a mom or a, a retired person or whatever your you know, Monday to Saturday is, that's where you live a life of true and proper worship. This passage is not calling everyone out of the world to come and be in a holy huddle. What it's doing is trying to call everyone to be equipped to know that God has called you to be in the world, representing Him every single day. And so for three and a half years, I've been just badgering these students. Please understand that you're not called to come out of the world. You're called to be equipped to go back into the world. And that's what this passage is talking about now. You know, we get into Romans and there was two extremes. There were those that are like, okay, to be faithful to Scripture, we need to withdraw completely. And then the other extreme is, no, 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 we've got to be relevant to culture and, and assimilate completely and look exactly the same. But what God's saying and what Paul's saying through Romans is that you need to withdraw to be equipped in order to go back and make a difference. There's no point of being a Christian if we only withdraw. And there's no point of being a Christian if we only assimilate. It has to be both. And what this passage is saying is that if you want to walk in the good and pleasing and perfect will of God, you've got to figure out how to do Christianity every single day in a way that is missional, in a way that makes a difference, in a way that equips other people and shows Jesus every single day. So that's the context of this passage. It's in view of God's mercy. Right straight away, this is in view of God's mercy. This isn't putting a saddle on your back that you cannot carry. This is a gift of God saying, your life is a living sacrifice. In other words, you get up daily and you choose to live your life for Christ. You get up daily and choose to live your life as a living sacrifice. Someone who is living, filled with the Holy Spirit, but in submission to the will and the purposes of God. That's your call. Isn't that epic? I love that's what God has called us to do. So we're not called to just be a holy huddle that is withdrawn from the world, and we're not called to assimilate so we look no different. We're called to withdraw to be equipped to go back. And that's what this passage is saying. Verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to you. Okay, it's quite a funny verse, I think. Um, it's saying you should look at yourself with sober judgment, not more highly than you ought, but in accordance with the way God has made you. You know, so God has made you correctly, so you need to look at yourself the way God looks at you. You know, sober judgment is the opposite to drunk judgment, right? Sober judgment, drunk judgment. And so, I don't know if you hang around many drunk people, um, but drunk people will look at themselves in either one of two ways, okay? Especially if they've had a few. They'll either think that they're really, really epic, or they'll think that they're really, really trash. Have you noticed that? You get those drunk guys that are like, you know what, man? When I was young, I could pull any chick. You know, and they talk about all the stories, man, I could kick a football and, oh, you know, but I might even start taking football up again, you know, I mean, they're 55 and you know their knee's going to be blown out by the end of the day. You know, like that, you know, oh man, I'll get back into that, I must, you know, the overinflated view of self and they get on the dance floor and creep out all the young ladies. You, you've seen that, right? You've seen that guy. His name's normally Doug or something. Sorry if you're a Doug, right? But that seems, if there's any duds in the place, I apologise. So there's one extreme, drunks think they're really like, you know, epic. Or there's the other side where they're like, nobody loves me. And they've got a big vat of red wine, crying crocodile tears into there. You know, nobody's anybody like that. I'm hopeless, nobody cares. How could anyone love me? Right? That's the drunk judgment where we either are self-inflated or we are self-abasing. But what this passage is saying, no, don't worry about any of that. Look at yourself in accordance with how God has made you. Not over-inflated, but not under-inflated. Don't love yourself too much, but definitely don't hate yourself. Why? Because God has distributed, look at this, faith with you. He's working in accordance with your faith and he's giving you gifts. Right? 
So many times we put our gifts on the shelf because we think we're hopeless, or we misuse our gifts because we think we're too good. And what he's saying is, look, just get in the line here, get in the middle and, and realise that it is by grace I have gifted you. And you walking in grace is going to see that appropriated both inside and outside the church, and then the kingdom will come. Right? So don't look at yourself, you know. And then Paul says, look at ourselves through God's eyes, not too highly or not too lightly. That was such a bad point because I thought I was on my next page. You know how that didn't make sense? I thought I was on the next part of the verse. Anyway, verse 4. Okay. <laughs> So just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Okay, this is kind of zeroing in on one of the main points of this passage. Okay, the body of Christ is seen as a body with many members. Okay, that's like what we look like when we gather together, not just on Sundays, but all the time. And these members do not all have the same function. One of the best things about being in the people of God is that you're not expected, nor required, nor called to be the same as anybody else. If you're the same as anybody else, that doesn't make sense. Like, what, what kind of a person would have eight feet? You'd be like, that's a freaky person. You don't need eight feet, you need two feet, two hands. And if all the parts or the body are working together properly, then the body functions the way it should function. And one of the misunderstandings and the, I think, greatest sins of the Western church is trying to make us all the same in the name of unity, but God's not calling us to uniformity. He's calling us to unity with diversity. Yeah. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to have different overflows. We're supposed to look different and use the gifts that God has given us to impact the world every single day. I remember a couple of years ago, I up here, I'm very comfortable today, right? I remember a few years ago, we went to a church Dadsy was going to, and I won't name it, back in the day, and halfway through the sermon, Jess leans over to me and goes, Oi, Pastor so-and-so looks a little bit different today. And I just lost it laughing, because it actually wasn't even Pastor so-and-so, it was his underling. And so she, this, the second in charge guy looked and acted and behaved so much like the first in charge guy that it took her half a sermon to realise that it was, she didn't even realise it wasn't him, she just thought he looked funny that day, right? We do this in church. Here's the truth, God isn't calling us to be the same. And the quicker we understand that, the more effective we'll be in society. You know... We are different and we should embrace that because God has called you to participate within the kingdom and within the world. And only you can do what you're called to do. Verse 6, we all have different gifts according to the grace given us. Alright, we all have different gifts. Every single person in this room, whether you've honed in on it or not, has a gift that God can use for His glory. At least one, usually more. And it's not because you've earned it, and it's not because you deserve it, but it's according to the grace given. You're gifted because God likes you and He wants to overflow His mercy into your life and equip you. He's given gifts to us. And what He does here is He lists a bunch. And I'll, I'll list them and then we'll pull them on part of the week. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. It's, if it's encouraging, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do so diligently. And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. This is one of the lists of the gifts, and we'll look at this list. Okay. What he's basically saying is, look, this is an example of what it looks like when the body of Christ embrace who they are and the different members step up and do what they're called to be. You know, be how they're called to be. Do what they're meant to do. And so he says, prophecy, do so in accordance with your faith. I'm just going to run through them all one by one. Okay, now prophecy of this um, list is probably the most misunderstood of all the gifts listed here. 
Now, what I want you to quickly get in your head before I go through this list is realize that these are gifts for both inside and outside the church, and they function both inside and outside the church, and they're an example of how God might be calling you and calling you up and encouraging you. So it says, prophecy, you know, do so according to your faith. See that? In accordance with your faith. Now, prophecy, man, in its essential, like, boiled down form is hearing from God and doing something with it. That's it. Having an ear to hear God and then doing something with it. Right? This is a gift that I wouldn't call myself a prophet or a prophetic person, but every now and then I get prophetic words that are helpful for within the church. Okay, so sometimes that happens in preparation. You might think, okay, this is the sermon series we need to do. You're hearing from God, okay, that's what we need to do. Maybe it's like, okay, you need to call this person, and then you call them, and they're like, oh, I was really hoping for a call this week. So that's like the prophetic gift working. A couple of weeks ago, we had an opportunity where I really felt that in the church service, we needed to pray for healing, right? Do you guys remember that? A few weeks ago, I was like, okay, guys, we need to pray for healing. Um, does anyone here need healing? You know, and Dadsy, do you remember you put your hand up on behalf of someone at work? And we prayed for Ash. And that was kind of it. And it was cool that we prayed for these guys. But then through the next week, like 10 of the congregants um, came up to me and like, that was spot on, man. I really um, needed healing. And, and did, but I just didn't want to respond at that time. Now, that's fine. I'm not calling anybody out because there's so many of you guys that you don't, I'm not talking about you directly. But what happens in the church is that sometimes there'll be a prophetic word that we need to act on. And if we don't act on it when it's time, then kind of the moment's missed. Have you ever noticed that? When God's kind of like, okay, we've got to do something right now and we don't act, we miss it. Now, there's no condemnation in that, but what we've got to do and grow in as our church and traditionally as people with a Baptist background is understanding that prophetic ministry isn't a weird ministry just for the guys who grow dreadlocks and live in the desert. It's like a very practical, everyday um, ministry that should be used both inside and outside the church. So for myself, I'll get unctions like that for inside the church, but then... At the moment, there's all these tradies working in our street because of the stimulus package everyone's renovating, right? And so all week, there's tradies everywhere. And the other day, there was a dude at the end of our driveway tiling, and I really felt the Lord say, go and hang out with that guy. Right, sweet. So I just went down, hung out with him, ended up coming over for coffee, and we had a really good chat about the Lord. Okay, so the prophetic gifts, not just like this, it's not a random gift that doesn't have practical application. It's very much hearing from God. And some of you work in this gift. You just might not have ever identified as a prophetic gift. You know? Um, Andrew Grant, he's like our brethren prophet, right? <laughs> Andrew Grant is like, if, if you don't know who he is, he's got a brethren background. Brethren are known for like kind of not really being very excitable human beings, you know, like, <laughs> right? Love the word of God, but don't want to yell out during a sermon or anything. If you get a mmm out of him, it's the same as someone else doing a cartwheel. You're like, mm, right? <laughs> But Andrew can look at a system. His prophetic gift is for the now. He can look at a system and go, this is what we need to tweak. He just looks at it and he knows. It's a God-given gift. And he uses that inside the church here to help us. And he uses it outside of the church in his workplace um, to lead prophetically there. Right? Jimmy Bell down the back there, he's more of a long-range prophet. Now, the, these are rare. People who are like, okay, I really feel like this is what you're going to be doing in six months from now. You know, and, and so that's really a handy gift to have within the church, and I'm really thankful for that. But Jim also uses it in the church, but also when he's down flying his planes with his mates, his model planes, he's thinking, you know, God, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to speak? So all these gifts are used within the church and outside of the church. Because God wants to equip you in here to help you effective out there. You know, the ch as a church, we need to be good at this because the church is declining in Australia. Why? But it doesn't mean we have to as a people. Okay, so we've got that. We've got serving, and it says if it's serving, then serve. I like that. Like, if you're just serving, then just serve. Nobody can stop you serving. Do you know what I mean? You don't need to go to a serving course, like a life group training course. Just serve. And people who serve within the church are a blessing within the church, aren't they? Like, we run on volunteers. We run on helping each other out. So if your gift is serving, serve and, and do so awesomely. But how much does it speak volumes when you take this gift that we're used to, when we're used to serving each other, and then do something with that out in culture, 
It spins people out when you do something for them and ask for nothing in return. It really speaks volumes in the spiritual realm. You know, be the guy who is washing up everybody's cups in the staff office, even though the sign says, wash up your cups after yourself. There's always a bunch of people who leave the coffee cups there, and at the bottom is all that skanky coffee that's been there for two weeks. <laughs> Clean it up for someone else and just put it away, and you never know what kind of an impact that will have. You know, as a tradie, maybe when you're finished packing your tools up, help one of the other trades pack up their tools. It'll scream volumes in the spiritual realm. They won't even know what to do. And a couple of weeks ago, we went down for coffee early in the morning, and because I'm a bit tender, I don't like sitting on wet seats, so I brought us out, because I was thinking, hang on, there's going to be a bit of dew around. And I got down there, and the seats were wet. So we wiped them off, and we all had our dry seats, okay? And we were sitting there enjoying our coffee. It was about six in the morning, so it's cold, but like a nice warm seat came. It was good. Anyway, there was this other guy who turned up, and he was trying to do this to his seat. You know how, you know how your hands knows how? Like, you're just trying to, yeah. And I was looking at him, and I'd settled in by this phase. And I was, like, in the middle as well. Of the, there was a person on both sides of me, so it was hard to get out. You know, I'm like, oh. And I'm just looking over at him, and I see him. And then one of the other dudes looked over, and instantly just grabbed the towel and went over and joyfully, like, you know, dried off the towel, and it made this guy's day. Now afterwards I'm like, Dave, you could have done that. And I wasn't condemning myself, but I was a bit disappointed that it wasn't my first reaction. You know, I was a bit more comfortable. Anyway, I'm walking back to the car, and then there's this lady doing these ones. So I run up there and freak her out and fling off the table. And that 30 second gesture actually made her day. You could tell she was so stoked. Do you know, we don't have to do very much to represent God in society. Like, he's pretty, like, eager to go and bust into people's wells. And so, you know, if you're a server, serve. No one can stop you. Do it and do it well. You know, if you're teaching, then teach. I mean, how many people are glad that there are churches that value good teaching still? I, I know it's sickening when a pastor shouts out to his wife. But I have to say that during this Roman series, Jess has completely stepped up and driven our teaching team and really set a new bar. Like, I wasn't here last week because I was still in my bathrobe sick with Milani, but I watched Jess's sermon on Romans 9 to 11, and that is ridiculously good teaching. You know, like, we really value teaching. It's actually funny, she's really shot up during this series. I've stayed the same or got a little bit worse, which is a bit weird. <laughs> But, like, the gift of teaching within the church happens at a corporate level. You know, we're training guys. Amanda, next week you've got Ben Julie. Like, we're training people to be teachers. We need that. But also, we want to take the ability to teach the gospel of Jesus out into society. You know, we are living in a biblically illiterate culture where things in the Bible are getting more and more foreign to people. You can be the person that teaches that to humans. You don't need to go out with your physical scripture and read parables of people. Have the word of God written on your heart so when you're out and somebody asks a question, you're teaching the Bible. Maybe you don't say Romans 8, 7 says this, but maybe you get to teach biblical principles. Maybe you get to represent Jesus. Maybe you get to show his kindness and love to humanity. You know, people who have the ability to teach should teach. If you get this teaching, then teach. You know, and even on another level, like people who have a vocation of teaching, of education, literally are some of the most effective, like, ministry people in society where you've got 30 people to disciple for an entire year. Teachers are so important to children. And if you're an educator in this room, you're walking out the, the, the gifts of God in your life. You know, he has called us to all these different gifts. If it is encouraging then give encouragement. I like this. It's like, okay, well, this is the gift, then do it. How good is it when there is encouragement within the people of God, where people inside the church call each other up and say, you know what, you're doing fantastic. I noticed you did this, thank you so much. You know, oh man, you seem a bit downtrodden. Is there anything I can do for you? You know, we're called to love each other sacrificially. We're called to encourage one another. It doesn't take much to encourage somebody. Do you know what you do? I, I like to give encouragement and all you do is find something you like about the person and tell them about it. 
It's literally what people want. Sometimes they don't like receiving it because we are Australians, unfortunately, and like when someone says something nice and kind, we're like, <laughs> get lost. <laughs> you, know, like, <laughs> you know, but we've got to get good at this, eh? And I, I look around, I could encourage you guys for the rest of the day. Like, there's some rad people here. And so we need to, inside the church, keep a culture of encouragement. It also stops there being division. It also, you know, cuts off any, like, potential for divisive groups to pop up when you encourage one another. Um, but also, you take that into society and you encourage people outside the church. And, man, I tell you, people are itching for something kind to be said about them. Itching for someone to get alongside them and not rip them down and not point out their failures and not get on their Facebook feed and be negative, but just to speak words of life into them. If your gift is encouragement, do it here and do it well, but also take it into the world and be salt and like speak words of life over people. Like, this is what we're called to. This is part of being the body, is participating in something that's essentially quite fun. Yeah. All right? Giving. Right? If it's giving, then give generously. You know, inside the church, we run on generosity. You know, that's how churches are financed. We're on generosity. We're run because people are convicted by God that this is somewhere to sow seed. And they do so generously. And giving generously to the church is a, a really essential and it's a really vital part. And it's a discipline and it's a biblical principle. So everyone who gives, awesome. If you don't yet give, no condemnation. Just do some business with God about why that is. You know, think that through. So inside the church, generosity is a vital gift. And it has practical outworkings. Has anyone noticed how rad our um, playground floor is? Okay. Now, you might not have, if you don't have kids, you don't even know there's a playground out there. Because before you have kids, you're like, who cares about kids? But once you have them, <laughs> right? Well, that's how I was anyway. Uh, but we had, a, um, we had a floor on the, on the playground that was tripping people over. Like, it was dog earing up, and the kids would fall in every now and then, a mum as well. And though that's funny on YouTube, it's not very practical. Like, um, so what we did was put down a proper professionally laid, um, you know, according to all the guidelines, specifications, and it was more expensive than if we did a dodgy thing ourselves. And we did that on the back of the generosity of the people from this church. See, generosity has practical outflowing. We want this place to be a place where the kids are happy, where they're safe, where they grow in the presence of God and want to be around this place. Remember, I don't know if anyone grew up in the church where you were a kid and you dreaded going there because you knew you were going to get yelled at and there was no play equipment and you'd get in trouble for picking your nose and everything else, right? There was no fun and the biscuits were horrible. You didn't get the good biscuits like the adults and you had that watered down cordial, right? We don't want that. We want our kids to enjoy it here. And so generosity overflows in practically things happening, you know? So inside the church, we live on it, but outside the church, being generous is like getting a megaphone in the spiritual realm and yelling out, Jesus is alive. Like generosity, when you display that to people who aren't part of a church community, usually baffles them. I'm not saying that people outside the church won't be generous, but the way we've been kind of taught to demonstrate selfless generosity, it speaks volumes. You know, in Australia in 2019, 68% of Australians gave to charity. Hmm? Who thinks that? That's pretty good. 68%? Yeah, 68% gave. But on average, of those 68%, people gave one third of 1% of their income. So those 68% of people gave, it was the equivalent of someone on $100,000 giving $300, but that was the average. So there's a lot of people giving, but we're giving very low amounts. If you um, want to get more into this, look at some interviews with Tim Costello um, on the Today Show when he was finishing up as the CEO of World Vision. Some amazing stats, right? So like though we give percentage, the 68% of all Australians give, 300 bucks a year? When you're making 100 grand? You know, when you give, it's in contrast to a culture of stinginess. And imagine in a society where everyone's trying to accumulate, if you're like overtly giving, it's going to be showing people that Jesus is real. It's putting money where your mouth is. 
Do you know, we can say all day long we want to be generous, but if there's no evidence of it, then we're just saying it. We're not living it out. And so it's a blessing. So if you're a giver, do so generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If you've got a position of leadership within the church, be diligent with it. Just be diligent with it. If you've got a life group, lead it well. If your little place of leadership is welcoming people and helping someone else out, then just do that well. You know, when our food roster comes back after this mystery illness leaves, right, then, you know, if you're on baking that day, bake well. You know, if you, lead a, if you are on leadership team or eldership, do it diligently. Like inside the church, it's the same principle we, like with giving. We run on generosity of people and leadership's generosity. It's taking your nights out to meet with people. It's, you know, taking time to seek the Lord. It's signing up to the spiritual battles that come with leadership. And so this passage is saying, if you're called to lead inside the church, do it diligently, but also outside. You know, if you're a boss or you've got a position of leadership outside of the church in culture, you're going to be held accountable for how you treat your employees and how you lead your organization. And it is an opportunity to set yourself apart as someone who represents God or just confirm that you're just another Christian hypocrite like everybody else they've ever met. You know, we've got this opportunity. If God has called you to lead, if you've got staff, if you've got employees or you're a you know, contractor or whatever it is, if you do so diligently, like generosity is screaming, Jesus is real. See how this works? I get pumped by this stuff because it means we're all participants in seeing the kingdom come. We just got to recognize what we're built for and do that. And then lastly, if it's to show mercy, do so cheerfully. Showing mercy is giving compassion or forgiveness to someone even though you have the power to punish them. Mercy is choosing not to enact your right to punish. That's what mercy is. Now, you've been shown mercy because Christ could have you know, enacted any justice on us at any time and he shows us mercy. But when we show mercy to each other, both inside and outside the church, it speaks volumes about the kingdom of God. Showing mercy inside the church is letting somebody off when they're rude to you because you know they're just going through something. Not holding them to account. You know you were mean to me. No, just let it go. Showing mercy cheerfully. Cheerfully letting someone off the hook before they even ask for your mercy. That's what mercy is. Not taking up our rights. Not standing on what we deserve, right? That's what mercy is. If you've ever shown mercy inside and outside the church, it, it speaks volumes. I was the recipient of mercy once when I was driving after a fight with Jess and I touched another car with my car. <laughs> I was pulling into the service station. I don't know if I told you this. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't this car, it was the white car a few cars ago. Okay. And so I was pulling into the service station at, uh, at the entrance to Palm Beach Ave there, right near the police station, which made it a bit more scary. There's a little police beat there. Turned too early and then clipped the front of this guy's car. Now, nobody was around. And I was pulled over and I was like, nobody's around. Right? And I went through the process. I'm like, no one saw me. And then eventually I'm like, no, God saw me, Dave. It's the right thing to do. Go in and confess. Okay? So I looked at the car and there was actually a bit of damage to his car. And so I went in and knocked on the door. And this shirtless Samoan guy <laughs> opened the door. Massive dude with all the tribal tats. And I got so scared, man. I'm like, this guy's going to bash me, hey? And I'm like, um, I'm really sorry, man, but um, I hit your car out the front. Anyway, he didn't say much. And he came out and had a look at it. And the front guard was all pushed in. And so he just like reaches down with his big Samoan biceps. I'm like, man, they're going to crush me in a second. And just pulls it out. And just looks at me and goes, no worries, bro, it's all right. <laughs> and also, I'm like, no, man, like, do you want some money? He goes, no, it's not too bad. It's here, bro. And I'm like, it, was, it would have been hundreds of dollars worth of damage, and he sh that's mercy, right? I deserve to pay. He let me off the hook, right? I probably deserved a punch. He let me off the hook, right? Because I sat there just deliberating whether I should leave or not. That's where the punch comes. He showed me mercy and I drove away going, I want to show mercy like that to someone else one day. 
And then in that same car, a couple of months later, I got rear-ended. I didn't tell you that either, by the way. Um, but it had, a, it had a tow bar, so all that happened was that my tow bar went through their guard. And so even though it was their fault, it did no damage to my car, and the guy's going, I'm so sorry, man. I'm like, ah, don't worry about it, bro. And I got in and drove away as well. Do you know what I mean? It's just little things, but hopefully that spoke to him with some, like, it's stressful, right? And we get the power to let people off when we show mercy. I know that you may not naturally tend towards something on this list, but there's other lists in the Bible. There's one in 1 Corinthians 12, there's one in Ephesians 4, and there's many lists about the body with many parts because God wants you to be a participant in the kingdom of God. There's no spectators. But the cool thing is, he's not calling you to be something someone else is. In his grace, he has called you not to be like everybody else, but just to figure out what you do so you can do that well. And so that's it. That's freedom, right? There's no condemnation or obligation in this. It's actually opportunity to participate. When Christians know who they are because of God calling them, when they have sober judgment going, you know what, I make mistakes, I do. But man, I'm a son, I'm a daughter, I am called by God. I've got 80 whatever years to make a difference. I'm going to make a difference in any capacity I can. Then God's got something to work with. You know, the parable of the talents, the only guy who gets in trouble wasn't the most gifted person or the person who was half gifted again. It was the person who just didn't have a crack. All God wants for you is participation. I'm encouraged by this. It doesn't matter if you're not a theologically trained, astute person. Potentially, that might do you injustice. All that matters is that God has called you to make a difference. Do you know who you've been called to be, both inside and outside the church. Because it's super important, hey. Imagine if we had a church with no encouragers. What a dreary place that would be. Right? Or we had a church with no diligent leadership. We just all stood around looking at each other. What are we doing? Right? You know, they didn't know to take charge and, and, and move the thing forward. What if we had a church where nobody served? Came here, there's no coffee to be drunk. You know, there's no bev on the door. Just sit around. This is fun. I'm going home. Do you know what I mean? Like it matters inside the church, doesn't it? But then if we can start taking this out, I think what it does is it takes the pressure off what we're supposed to do with our Christianity from Monday to Saturday. I think so often, this is what I've been trying to brainwash these students about for three and a half years, is that you don't... You don't have to have God's will sorted out so carefully and like ridiculously predetermined that you feel stressed every time you think you might be outside of it. His will is for you to display love to humanity, to love God and to love others. And so if you do this, you're going to be showing love. If you can bring, say you brought a prophetic word to someone, and it doesn't need to be like you get all weird and I've got a word. All it can be is working up to a work, workmate and saying, you know what? God's telling me to tell you that he loves you. And, and if you've heard from God, they might be like, oh, good, he may, or whatever, but you know in their heart something's happening, hey, because you've heard from the Lord. Maybe your ministry has been standing on the other side of the kitchen bench as your kids sat there on the stools and you fed them afternoon tea and you served them and you heard their heart for the last two decades. That's God's calling. Right, God's calling us to our families, isn't he? He's calling us to every part, but he's calling us to our families too. Well, then that's doing God's will. I don't think we need to overcomplicate this, but I also think we don't need to undersell it. It's not complicated, but it's super important. I look around here, man, and I think there are some just, just epic people called by God to make a difference. Hey, that's the purpose that's going to drive you into your golden years, knowing that God's going to one day say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a little. Let me put you in charge of many things. If you don't know where to go from here, reread this passage. Read 1 Corinthians 12. Read Ephesians 4. And if you're still a little blurry on um, 
you know, what God's calling you towards. Can you text me and let's get together for coffee? I've only got to fight the M1 once more in my life. I'm going to be much more available. <laughs> you know, one of the reasons we feel like it's time to finish in Bruce is to be available at LT. I'm going to be doing no other. I've been by vocational for 15 years and I'm so tired of having two things happening at once. That's finishing on Tuesday, <laughs> Tuesday afternoon. I'm still supposed to go back for the next two weeks, but what are they going to do now? <laughs> <laughs> Be diligently, Dad. Sorry, I said that. Right? A couple more weeks, mark some essays, give everyone a HD and get out of there. <laughs> but I want to be here to encourage you guys up. I'm available now. Jess is more available. We've got a few things to sort out with her health, and then we're going to be free just to be pastors here again. It's going to be epic, man. See God move. So let's pray. And if you need any help further than this sermon, please let me know. So Lord, I want to... Father, we come before you saying, God, you have simply called us to do what you have built us for inside and outside the church. It's really not hard. Lord, I want to pray for those in this room who feel a little blurry or just a little bit like confused about what their part to play in the puzzle is or, you know, what's their part in the body? Father, will this week do some ministry, Lord God. Would you show them where they belong, what they're good at, what they could you know, bring to the table, um, not just in the church, but to the kingdom table, Lord God. If you say you lay out a feast before us in the presence of our enemies, Lord, and I just feel like that's just an opportunity for us to sit with people and just be, be your representatives, Lord God. Father, help, um, help us get this balance right, the inside and the outside, the, you know, the inward and the outward. I thank you, Lord God, that there's no condemnation. Father, that this isn't to beat ourselves on the back with a whip. This is to, to start seeking your face. And uh, maybe even be reinvigorated with uh, what we're called to. You know, reinvigorated for the kingdom. Lord, I pray, you know, maybe some of us have felt a bit jaded with just church and stuff in general. Lord, I pray that this might, you know, bring a bit of life back. Lord God, some uh, excitement about what it means to be followers of the King. And, and mission, you know, outward focus ambassadors of the kingdom here on the Goldie. Yeah, thank you, God, for these passages. Thank you that you teach us a lot about what to do with our faith. And, yeah, we want to partner with you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.